Hi everyone, welcome to our third webinar and what's turning out to be our series around managing our centers during this pandemic. We continue to hope for your good health and sanity during these times. We've been trying to respond to your concerns, especially as we hear what's getting traction on our member listserv. We are so grateful that our guest speakers could respond quickly to our community by participating today and speaking around this topic about reopening nonprofit centers as city and state stay at home orders or restrictions begin to lift gradually. Um, we wanna keep in mind that it's still strongly encouraged in many places to stay home as much as possible and when you're out in public settings to be wearing a mask. We emphasize to our speakers and wanna make it clear to you that we all share, what we all share today is not necessarily the answer of how each of you should open your own space. You need to take your local city and state orders into consideration and make decisions that are best for your employees, your tenants, and your communities. We are not offering legal advice or direction here while each of us is consulting that on our own, but we wanted to make sure we provide a snapshot of the various issues that each of our guest speakers are looking at and how they are coming up with solutions that will likely still evolve. Sorry, I'm just getting to our next slide here. Um, if this is your first time joining us, my name is Lena Waite and I'm the consulting coordinator for NCN. I'm joined by my colleagues today, David Schreyer and Lexi Paza, NCN's recently appointed co-directors. If you have suggestions for future topics, please do not hesitate to reach out to us with them. We are here to help you um, with all of your shared space, shared services and social purpose real estate needs as a way to promote nonprofits working smarter and more effectively reaching their goals through this time and always. Um, these are the list of benefits that you receive as members. Typically our webinars are $40 a webinar for non-members, but at this time we wanted to provide as much information to you as possible at no cost. We are a very active community and if anything, this current pandemic has just highlighted how we continue to support one another in this niche area of the nonprofit world. And we desire success for all nonprofit centers to um, survive and thrive, not just the individual ones we operate. So please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions about membership or are interested in joining our community based on what you hear and what you um, see here today. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you have questions for our panelists, which we expect you will, please use the Q&A box, which you will find by either scrolling to the top or the bottom the bar will appear in the Zoom window. Um, if you want to just talk to the group in general, share any information um, to all panelists and attendees, make sure it's in the chat box. It does say to all panelists and attendees, um, but other, and you can put technical issues there as well, as well. But questions for the panelists should go in the Q&A box and that will just help us filter those out and make sure we see them. Um, for the most part, we'll save, be saving the Q&A for the end. Um, but if you think of a question as we go, don't hesitate to, to throw that in there. We'll try to get to it if it's relevant to the current speaker, but otherwise um, save it for the end. So we are extremely grateful to have the participation of these three speakers today. As one of Chris's tenants at the Alliance Center in Denver, it gives me great privilege to introduce him as a self-proclaimed geek who loves learning about the latest and greatest energy efficiency technology for work or home. If you ask him why he lives for sustainability, he would say it is for the betterment of the world for his children's future. This focus is the foundation of his investment in leading his organization's effort for many of their green building certifications, including their recent LEED Platinum accomplishments. He is also an active member of USGBC's Market Leadership Advisory Board for Colorado and is on the Sustainability Committee for Denver's International Facility Managers Association. We are also joined by NCN Steering Committee member, Dr. Cameron Hodgins, who received her PhD in developmental psychology from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. In October, 2014, she became the CEO of Glasser Schoenbaum Human Services Center in Sarasota, Florida. And she was named, uh, oh, sorry, which was named after the STEAM founder, Dr. Kay Glasser. Dr. Hodgins is a graduate of the Leadership Sarasota program, and she's served in a variety of leadership roles including Vice Chair of the Leadership Council for the Greater Sarasota Chamber of Commerce, as well as Designing Daughters, Sarasota County's Community Alliance, the Manatee County Children's Service Advisory Board, and she was recognized as the Public Citizen of the Year in 2014 by the National Association of Social Workers, and is a winner of SRQ Magazine's Women in Business Award. Phew, Cameron, you are a busy woman. 
Um, we also invited Tim Moss, um, Executive Price, Vice President of Colliers International, um, on this conversation to speak to the continued value of space and what he's seen as a real estate broker throughout times of extreme economic fluctuation. Tim's primary focus is in the sale of investment transactions in the San Francisco Bay Area. He joined Colliers in 2003 after having spent the previous 13 years with, the, with GVA Whitney Cressman as head of its investment division and national practice. He is a member of Collier's Asset Resolutions team and affiliation of 200 Collier's International Investment and Leasing Professionals, representing the trillion dollar CMBS market. In his 27 year career, Tim has represented landlords on more than 3 million square feet of agency assignments and has sold over 300 commercial properties for a value exceeding 3 billion and for a variety of clients. Um, we will also be hearing from our own Lexi Paza um, to hear how they are processing and transitioning into their space at Tides. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over um, at least the video and mic to Chris. Thank you so much for joining us and um, just tell me when to move to the next slide. All right, thanks Lena and um, thanks for sharing a photograph that makes me look like I'm about 12. I'm sure everybody has a headshot like that, so I uh, appreciate it. Um, normally I don't touch much on our logo and our tagline, but I think our tagline is, uh, is certainly unique to share at this point in time, connecting people and inspiring impact. Given the circumstances in today's world, uh, connecting people is definitely one that we're trying to find new ways to do that. We're trying to ensure that our tenant community is really able to uh, experience what the Alliance Center is and what we bring to the Denver area. Um, as Lena mentioned, we are in Denver, Colorado. And Lena, next slide, please. We are in Denver, Colorado. Uh, this is a photograph of our lobby. We're a 40,000 square foot facility, downtown Denver. We're about a block from Union Station. This is, while there are a few staged uh, individuals in this picture, this is relatively consistent to what we see in our lobby. Our lobby is very well utilized. It's uh, well occupied by tenants, visitors, just a general public. Our coffee bar that you see in the back left, Serendipity Coffee, is one that is frequented by our tenants, our neighbors, and anybody else that kind of comes through the building. You see a little bit more about uh, the Alliance Center there on the left. We own and operate the building. We have 50 different organizations and about 80 to 85 percent of those are nonprofit organizations. So we are lucky to have quite a, a large variety of groups that are all focused on sustainability in one way or another. What that uh, area of sustainability is varies by each group. Next slide, please. One of the biggest pieces that we wanted to share that we found was the most helpful in any time of need and in any circumstance where there's uncertainty is just communication. We can't stress that enough. We've been through a, a number of instances in our building where communication has been paramount to not only retaining but growing our tenant base. It's been something that we thought is the most important aspect of ensuring that our tenants knew what we were doing, what they could expect from us, and where we could keep the ball moving forward with whatever is going on. With COVID-19, that has certainly remained true. Uh, just yesterday, we, were, we sent one of our many messages out to the building, and we've been tracking all that, all that messaging over the last six weeks, and we're up to about 65 or 70 pages worth of communication that's going out to our building. Uh, it's something that we feel is very important. And as we transition into the next phase, we will continue doing so and, and hope that that is the, the way forward. Next slide, please. As it relates to us going into the building or coming back to the building here in about, uh, technically Monday is when the stay at home order here at, or the safer at home order goes into effect here in Denver. What we are trying to do is we're trying to look at a three phase approach. The first is the stay at home, which was uh, implemented by our governor, Governor Polis. Our mayor, Mayor Hancock has uh, extended that stay at home beyond what Colorado was required to do. And 
we will go into a safe at home order here in here beginning on Monday. Beyond that, there also is the new normal that everyone is talking about. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what that's going to look like, but we're trying to look at different areas. So over the last couple of weeks, the stay at home order has been in effect and we were working on maintaining an empty building. What systems did we need to focus on? What areas did we, could we turn off? Could we turn down? Could we modify for our building operations? What tenant needs are there? Uh, one of the very most common questions that we get from our tenant community is about mail. Can I still collect mail? Can I still come in and get it? What deliveries will still be happening? Um, I think that is one of the more unique situations that we've been exposed to, to try and find alternatives to collecting mail if, uh, if the stay at home and safer at home orders uh, are extended or come back in the fall or later in 2021. Um, so what, what did we learn while we were gone? I think is an important piece. What systems do we need to upgrade? Do we need to modify so that we can uh, remotely monitor them? I'm very fortunate that 90 to 95% of the systems in my facility are, are able to be monitored remotely. So that was very easy to do. And then continuity or emergency plans. What changes need to go into effect? I would be surprised if very many of us uh, had plans in place for a scenario like we are seeing today. So where, are we, where do we go from there? Next slide, please. Uh, at this point in time, currently we are in a phase of trying to prepare our building and prepare our tenants for return. Um, I'm here in the building today. I'm working on identifying uh, areas where that would be most appropriate for individuals to sit. You can see the blue and the green on the right hand side of the screen. This is mirroring some of the professional organizations or uh, larger corporations. Gensler is one, JLL is another that have shared information similar to this. Signage, uh, occupancy, what do we need to do in order to make sure that people are maintaining social distancing, wearing masks, ensuring that our air quality is of, of a high value, our water quality is of a high value. How are people getting to work? Are they driving more frequently now that mass transit may be contaminated? Are they using their bike, which means that they need a shower, but we can't provide our showers due to cleaning needs. There are a number of considerations that we've gone through that all of the that all of us are trying to look at on our team to make sure that when we come back to the building everyone is as healthy and as possible realistically it's it's our one of our most important things and i don't want to gloss over it but equity is another major piece of what we want to do we have a we have a organization in the building that is blind that we have to be mindful of for additional signage that we're, that we're putting up? Are there tenants that are uh, having financial problems because of this? What can we do for them? There are very many things that we need to look through and consider as we're continuing down the path. Next slide. And how do we prepare those individuals? Um, it wouldn't be without the people that are in our building. Uh, there, where I wouldn't have a job, our team would not have a job, this building may be something completely different. So our most important piece is our tenant base to make sure that they understand what we're doing, they understand what, it, what is happening here in the building, and their health is the, is the highest priority. Um, you can see a number of topics that we're considering. The, many of these uh, realistically have come from the local municipalities, whether it be the state or the city, and we are certainly on a learning curve. It's not something that anyone on our team has direct familiarity with. It is a topic that we are learning. We are trying to stay uh, in front of the curve, in front of what is needed here in the building, and we hope that we're meeting those expectations and, and exceeding them where we can. Um, you'll see a number of topics there that I've shared previously with the building, but 
uh, communication is paramount. Uh, you'll see the frequently asked questions topic that we have on our website. I welcome you to visit that if you would like. It's uh, the alliancecenter.org and it's in our tenant portal. Um, if you want to use some of those questions, please do. Please use it for your own tenant base. It's, there's a number of topics that are certainly worth considering. Um, uh, there's a, yeah, next slide, please. So with all of that, what realistically will be our new normal? I certainly do not know. I don't think there is anyone in our building or in the city of Denver, the United States that knows what our new normal will be. If you do, please let us know. Uh, please chat it into the text box here. The, what I do know, what I do expect and what we expect are these areas to the right. Um, we, we assume that air quality will be of concern, water quality, cleanliness, how frequently are we cleaning our building? How frequently are we cleaning common surfaces, high touch surfaces? Um, we're sharing that information. We are increasing our cleaning surfaces, even though prior to this event, they exceeded the CDC standards. Um, general wellness, just health. How can we uh, encourage wellness in the building, whether it's uh, looking at using the stairs more frequently, food, water, et cetera, et cetera. Mental health, I cannot stress that one enough. We were talking as a, as a group of presenters before this that mental health is a major component of where we will end up going. And I think I can't stress that one enough. Social distancing, connectivity to the building. We do believe that there always will be an Alliance Center and what that may look like will be different. Uh, in the next six or 12 months, perhaps. But there always will be the need to be connected to one another. So how do we encourage that and how do we continue to make that happen? Next slide, please. So realistically, there's those three phases, the stay at home, the safer at home, and then our new normal. We're hoping that in order to uh, get to the pictures that you see here, we can maximize that. We can show that the Alliance Center is where uh, we want nonprofits to come here in Denver and where our tenant base can be healthy and happy. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity to share uh, a few moments. Lena, if you go to the next slide, this will be a good one for everyone to, sh to see. There's a number of resources here. Um, we, have, we have relied heavily on many of these. Please take a screenshot of this picture. I do believe Lena will be sharing the slides here at the end of the presentation as well, but um, yes, there that are- is true. There are a number of resources here that will help very much. Um, then that's, that's really all I have to share. And Chris, just a quick question. Um, are you guys keeping your front doors unlocked for visitors or locked currently? Uh, currently, they will remain locked for the time being. Um, we're working on the timing of that, but they will remain locked for the time being. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate your time. And yes, we'll send out the slides so you'll have all of this info. So don't worry if you're not um, taking your screenshots fast enough. Um, all right, Cameron, I'm going to hand it over to you. Oh, my heavens. <laughs> there we go. Hang on a second. You're all good. There we go. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Cameron Hodgins, and I'm coming to you live from my laundry room. So I'm um, here in Sarasota. Um, it's great to be here today and see 197 people on this call. Um, thank you, Lena, for this uh, um, aerial shot of our campus. I don't have pretty slides like Chris had, but I definitely um, echo a lot of the same sentiments that he's just expressing. So this picture here is our campus. It's five acres and it's 14 separate buildings. Um, many of the roof lines you see sort of in the front of the photo, and then there is a sort of a flat white roof line on the, on the right side, that is our children's clinic too, and that's a part of our campus. I've been at Glasser almost six years and um, usually every day cursing the fact that it's 14 separate buildings uh, just for the maintenance, but it's actually a blessing right now just for the social distancing um, issues going on. Are we open? Um, we never really officially closed. Florida started to um, reopen in, in a phase one by the governor on Monday. And um, I pulled the campus leadership together yesterday. And what's really interesting is, 
and, and this is what I think is really important and what's helping guide my team is, is empathy and nimbleness, if that's a word. So um, I feel like investing a lot of time and effort into big plans right now while may make us feel more secure, it, it's just so much unknown that I, I'm hesitant to do something like that. So when you say, what's your reopening plan? We literally are just about taking it day by day. Um, I, I obsessively watch the COVID testing rates and positive numbers for the state and our county. Um, I still think there's a lot that we don't know. And I'm just not willing to risk exposure and risk to, to not only our staff and tenants, but to the people that visit the campus, um, our foot traffic. So that's where we are. And, and when I talk to the, um, our members, our tenants, there is the same hesitancy and empathy and everybody is, is still working from home for the most part. If they are providing services, everybody's using a lot of telehealth and um, video chats and um, doing board meetings that way, doing staff those calls that way, um, everything. However, um, one thing I do want to say about communication, and I echo Chris, communication has just been so important, not only to the community about services available and where they are and how to access them, but um, on our website, I think, to the broader community, and, and for those of you in fundraising, you'll, you'll um, resonate with this, just your donors want to know what you're up to and, and how you're doing, are your doors open, um, can you come and, and get an appointment there. So I think having a page on your website about it is, is important. Um, so not only communicating with the people that come to you for services, but with people that are supporting you as well. Uh, we were fortunate last year to get a grant to update some security on our campus and um, both with cameras and key fobs. And it just happened to be serendipitous time on that. And I'm really grateful that we did that. Um, our COO, who is on this call, can be at home and see our security cameras and um, what's going on in the campus. And so that's really nice is, is having those cameras in place. Um, our maintenance supervisor told me today that there was a bobcat on the, on the campus. And, and speaking of Chris uh, mentioning watching your systems, we've had a pipe explode sort of underneath that little palm tree garden area that you can kind of see below the bell tower there in the photo and it's leaking. And so if we hadn't been there every day, we wouldn't have seen that this is a mess right now. So as I speak, the water's off on the entire campus until Monday. So systems are very important. Uh, we are 30 years old too. So the, um, you know, we, we, we monitor our systems closely. Um, we are looking at, um, of course, building assessments right now and, and uh, touring a new AC company to look at how maybe we can shift contracts with somebody. It is a really good time to get those things done because people aren't in buildings. Carpet uh, replacement, renovation of any kind, um, now is the time because people aren't complaining to us that we're messing up their workflow. Uh, our maintenance supervisor is there every day. It, it may be more brief hours, but he is there checking on things and that's very helpful. Uh, recently, the two biggest inquiries from our tenants have been, are we going to provide COVID testing on the campus? My initial answer to that was no, because our community has public sites set up in different areas um, and they're very well publicized. However, I did speak to our health department representatives yesterday and they did say that they could set one up there. And again, if I'm looking at things through the lens of empathy and nimbleism, um, if that's a word, um, I think it's important to meet some of those um, inquiries from, from the staff. I, it's really important to me that everybody feels comfortable being there and, and kind of whatever it takes within budget reasons uh, or budget guidelines to get people back on campus. I'm definitely willing to entertain and uh, that's important. So we might set up a testing site on the campus, not to mention the neighborhood around us could access it as well. We have not stopped the cleaning service. We, we have a cleaning service that comes once a week, usually on Saturday or Sunday. However, they won't be there this weekend because of the water situation, um, but we have not stopped that. We also have security a person in the parking lot um, sort of late afternoon into the early evening, mid evening, and we've kept him there as well because we do know that some staff still is going onto the campus to work. Um, so we have kept those things up. Our building, which is, the one that you can see on the right, just underneath that, the bigger tree there, 
um, has two large conference rooms in it. And we have officially shut those conference rooms down. Our governor's order says that um, 10 or fewer people can be in the same space. But again, for, for us, it's about creating people's level of comfort. And you know, right now people are very understanding of that. I think we'll maintain this, this kind of way that we're working until the end of May for sure. And June will reassess. Again, it's, it's kind of about that flexibility. One thing that I think is important for those of you who may be in early stages of developing a center is building an endowment or a reserve fund. And I can tell you, we, we do have one of each and it's allowed a little bit of breathing room for this financially uncertain time. Um, obviously, one of our largest sources of income is, is monthly rent, and we do have a discounted rent. We, we only charge $8.50 a square foot a year. Um, so we do subsidize the actual expenses of, of that rent with other income. But if I had not, if we did not have that reserve, um, which is largely set up like a condo association, so each month some of the rent dollars go into a reserve, I would be a lot more anxious right now. Um, fortunately, however, and, and actually surprisingly, everybody's paying their rent right now. And I, like I, you know, I had them on, the, on a phone call yesterday and I expressed my gratitude um, for that. And I think what it told me was people still wanna be in an office. And I have to be frank, I was a little nervous, like maybe this will change the face of how we do business and how operations work, but there's still an appreciation of, of being in a collective campus. And I think that speaks highly of the, of the line of work that we are all in. So I'm, I'm happy about that. I have to agree with Chris too, that I know that my uh, level of awareness and my team of people's mental health and wellness and well-being is pretty high. Um, I go to the campus a couple times a week now just to sign checks and get, you know, some uh, things done more efficiently than I can do at home. And if I do run into somebody, they just are like, you know, they just want to talk and talk and talk and tell you about everything. And I, while in my, in the inside, I'm feeling a little bit rushed and pressured to get done what I need to. Um, I am trying to be really patient with that and, and know that people just need human contact and, um, of course, from a socially distance uh, uh, amount of space between us, but trying to be respectful of what people um, really need right now. And we've always joked, I, I share an office with our COO and it, that office has always been like a therapy spot for people to just come in and plop down and sit and talk, um, whether it's about their board or their programs or whatever. And I see um, that that might be even more of a need going forward. Personally, I'm uh, really excited to get back to work one day, but uh, I miss the work that we do. I'm, uh, you know, I'm an extrovert. It, it, we go into human services, obviously we like people, right? And so this has been very challenging um, for me and I look forward to getting back there, but of course not to risk anybody's health. Um, so that's kind of where we are and just really trying to be, um, you know, as flexible as possible. I'm just checking to see these questions, you know, or any of them for me or we're all good. Um, I think we're good for now because I know some of them Lexi's going to be addressing and how Tides is um, tackling this, um, but super helpful. Thank you. And yes, that mental health aspect is, is so important in the balance of protecting physical health along with that is our, is our ongoing challenge. But thank you so much, Cameron, for, for presenting and we'll catch you with the Q&A in the end here. Sure. Thank you. All right. So Lexi... I think you are up next and I'll get your slide going. Perfect. Um, hi everybody, my name is Lexi Plaza. I'm the Senior Manager of Real Estate and Operations at Tides and also wear the hat of one of the co-directors of NCN and work with David and Lena to um, support all of you as our members. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with Tides, I wanna give a little bit of information around our use case. Um, so Tides operates two collaborative workspaces, one in San Francisco and one in New York. The one in San Francisco is a 12 building campus, about 150,000 square feet of commercial real estate um, with about 80 tenants. And then in New York, we have two floors of a commercial condo and we are co-owners with some other um, nonprofit organizations there. And we have about 10 tenants. Um, the, we also have the San Francisco campus is also tied headquarters. So we have about 100 staff that, um, that typically would go to the San Francisco campus to work every day. Um, and a smaller team that works in New York. So um, 
we also have a, a cafe that's a small business on the San Francisco campus. So I, I recognize that um, what I'm about to walk through um, can feel a little dry. You know, we're all operations people. So I'm gonna be going through some nitty gritty about how Tides is thinking about reopening. Um, but I really wanna, wanna center um, the, the three pieces that, um, that we're trying to hold. The first is the vibrancy of the community. And of course, that's why we're in the business of collaborative workspace for nonprofits is because we believe that organizations that office together can ultimately be more effective um, and the vibrancy of the community really matters. The, of course, the safety of our employees as a Tides employee and as a Tides manager, as well as our tenants um, in both of our campuses. And then specifically to the cafe, we have this consideration of, of viability of a small business whose employees are also very much part of our community and are really at the center of, of the vibrancy of our community. The cafe is, is typically ranked as um, the place where the most people run into people who are not their colleagues. And so, um, and it's important that the small business survives this. Um, it's been really hard. None of them have, have gotten, um, you know, obviously they've been closed since the shelter in place order has been in, um, has been in effect. So that's another consideration. Um, so I, I just want to um, posit that we are thinking about the San Francisco campus as sort of zones where Tides headquarters, there are some considerations, there are some considerations for our tenants, and then we also need to have a really robust guest policy um, in order to keep the cafe up and going. Um, Lena, if you can go to the next slide. Thanks so much. So the first I, I'm going to go into is from a landlord and employer perspectives. I think that um, this has already been touched on, really a people first perspective. Um, some folks will not feel comfortable returning to the office even after um, you know, local, state, or federal guidelines um, mention that it's safe to do so. Um, some folks are at higher risk for impact of COVID-19. Some have lost their childcare. Um, I know that that'll be a consideration for all of us, that even if everyone could go back, there are people who um, simply have lost all of their options for, for um, safe childcare. And then those employees that rely entirely on public transportation, we're thinking about um, how to accommodate them as well. The common sense, I think we're seeing this, um, that it's important to weigh all of these recommendations that all of these resources that are being shared today to really think about how that makes sense in your center. For example, actually one of the hallways that you'll see in the photo, um, they are um, almost wide enough for people to be on either side and have the distance in between them. We've seen a lot of recommendations and already in grocery stores that there are um, arrows to suggest one-way traffic um, in, in either direction to reduce, to ultimately, um, you know, re reduce the spread. Um, but we're seeing that in, in some of our hallways, if we send people down one way, there's no fast way to get back to their offices. And so they ultimately would expose more people um, by doing this one-way track. And so we're just trying to bring some common sense and how do we keep people safe, but also take into consideration that, you know, each use case is going to be really unique and not all of the recommendations are going to work perfectly for your, for your space. Um, and of course, there's lots of industry standards being um, released, OSHA, CDC, EEOC. Um, and then if a building user becomes sick, um, it, it, I think in this case, we're thinking about that, not, not if, but when, how do you notify other people very quickly and close the building for, um, for cleaning? Um, you know, what, what, uh, what processes does your organization have in place to be able to um, sort of fly into action really quickly if, that, if and when that happens? Next slide, please. Um, this is a little bit of the, the nitty gritty. Um, the janitorial, um, as, as all of us have, have learned, it's not, this isn't like if you had pests in the building and you could, um, you know, bomb it once with some chemicals and the risk goes away. This is every time someone touches a high touch surface, um, a, a bathroom handle, a water fountain, it needs to be disinfected. Um, this obviously is a lot more work for the janitorial team. So we would recommend talking to whether it's an in-house or a vendor team, They're, you're gonna need to make some trade-offs. Maybe they empty the trash or take out the recycling less in order to accommodate this high touch surfaces. It, is it possible also to, to reduce the number of people that are touching doorknobs, for example, we are thinking of having our security guard be the one who's opening the door into tied secure space. So it's only his hands touching it versus, you know, the hundred folks that are heading into the office. Hand sanitizer, um, touchless stations is in as many places as you can, as you can squeeze them. 
every floor of the elevator, all bathrooms, copy rooms, I mean, even, even office equipment that is used by multiple folks. Um, and we'd recommend getting online and ordering these supplies as soon as possible because our lead time, even for the fast ordering, is already between three and four weeks. Also talk to your, if you work with a, um, a property management company, sometimes they have sort of back doors into some of these sourcing. So I recommend you chat with them if you can't find anything through your Google searches. Um, our seating, as you've, as you've probably read in, um, in all of the articles around office space that um, the seating is gonna need to be more spread out. We're removing a lot of the seating in common areas um, and in co-working areas, we're reducing the seating. Um, we also are removing all of the soft-sided furniture just because we can't clean the fabric as, as easily as the, hard, as the hard, hard surfaces. So unfortunately, the chairs that you see in the picture are going to need to be retired for a little while. Um, the shared offices, uh, we are, Tides is empowering the managers to work with their team to work on um, sort of an A-B scheduling. So especially if anyone shares an office, um, they are alternating days in the office. Um, the temperature taking, we're still, we're still working this out exactly how, how it will um, kind of play out, but um, ultimately a secure, the security guard or a reception team will be performing this. And we're thinking of using color stickers to show um, for each day. So if you, um, if you come in on a Tuesday and get your temperature taken and you're all clear, you get a green sticker, the next day you get an orange sticker to ensure that folks don't need to be rescreened as they're sort of cycling through the campus. We have lots of doors and windows, um, or sorry, doors and, um, and exits. So um, it's great to keep track so we don't need to recheck anyone. Um, so we're also gonna have some sort of self-certification. Um, I saw even Lyft right now on their app has a self-certification. So if you're interested in that right now, there's lots of examples of how to ask people to self-certify around exposure. Masks, we are ordering surgical style for guests. Um, and then we are buying some, we're purchasing some washable for staff. Um, we are also asking staff to bring in their own. So ours would just be backup if they, if they don't have theirs or theirs aren't clean. Um, but we are gonna ask that all of our guests wear masks. Um, and again, I mentioned that we do have this public aspect. So um, we, we're still working out exactly how we are gonna route traffic through our buildings, but um, we, uh, we think that all of the guests at the cafe will um, actually come in one door and out the other just to reduce, and then we all will have masks available at the door for them to grab. Work schedules, consider opening the, uh, the building earlier for people who rely on public transit um, and want to avoid crowds. Um, this might be more of a problem in places like New York City. There um, are, uh, it, it's a, a bit of a more well-oiled machine where they only want to open at a certain hour, so we're having conversations around our security vendor right now um, on whether they're willing to be flexible to open a bit earlier so folks can get in and get out. Um, and then visitors will be uh, sharing all of these policies with our tenants. Some tenants um, are, are gonna need to create their own depending on how many visitors they have. Luckily, we are mostly administrative offices, so the visitors to offices um, is kept uh, a bit at a minimum. We don't have any direct service, um, but, and, and again, we just say this policy is until further notice when we have more information around, you know, testing or, um, uh, or clearing of folks at risk. Go ahead for the next slide. Lexi, just a quick question around masks. Are you requiring tenants, staff to wear masks? And if so, are you requiring them to budget for that themselves? That's a, that's a great question. Um, if, I do want to note that we uh, we looked for N95 masks, um, but right now all of the suppliers that we saw said that they were saving them for medical personnel, which um, you know obviously we can, we can all understand. So the only ones that were available were surgical style, but again, that's more for um, to prevent the transmission when you're talking, sneezing, coughing. Um, we're going to order a, a a bunch and and maybe make some of them available to tenants. Um, it would certainly be required if they were any, in, in any of the shared spaces um, and that, that are still open, and that mostly includes the, um, the reception area where people will still be coming through, and then the cafe as well. Whether tenants wear them in their, in their offices will be up to them, but ultimately we have a lot of shared restrooms, and so we're planning on, I have a, a poster at the end to show all of you, um, even instructions on how to properly wear a mask. Um, that might be worth posting around your centers as well, just to make sure that if people are wearing masks, they are in fact using them effectively. Um, right. I, I do wanna mention that um, we do have meetings in conference rooms and the, um, this is usually a revenue driver for us, but we are gonna close them to, to external groups um, for the time being. We don't have an open date set. 
Um, we're thinking at least through the summer, we're going to be using large conference rooms for some meetings of tied staff and tenants, um, but reducing the published capacity down by at least half so that there's a safe six feet in between everyone who's seated. Um, and then the smaller conference rooms, we're actually turning all into private office space for those people who share offices to make sure that if people are going to come into the office, they have plenty of space if they're, if they're in a tight fit already. We um, are going to recommend that a Zoom option is, for, is provided for all meetings, even if people are on site, to give people an option to, um, to join remotely. We are blessed to have a lot of operable windows, um, at least in the San Francisco campus. Now that we understand a little bit more about this, the, the airborne spread, we know that circulation um, really helps. And so um, keeping windows open whenever possible to keep fresh air moving in. Um, and uh, also having cleaning supplies out and ready um, and having 30 minute gaps in between all meetings um, so that uh, the facility staff can, um, can wipe it down and there's no back to back, there's no tight trigger. Um, I also saw the, a question about air pur purifiers. Um, mm -hmm. We have not uh, we have not crossed that bridge yet, um, but I think that we we have them from this from the fires that happened in California last year. Um, so I think that that would actually be a great ad. So thank thank you for that recommendation. Um, just a few more facilities considerations. Um, our co-working program, um, we're just, we're gonna keep it small. We're not gonna do any more recruitment around co-working um, and make sure that cleaning products are available. So if any folks are using unassigned desks, um, one of the things that was recommended in, in some of the, the uh, published recommendations was that you ensure that you understand where people are sitting. So in the case that someone does, um, does test positive, you're able to track where they've been and, where, and what they've touched. And so um, with co-working, of course, there are unassigned desks. So we are just gonna ask that they're, they're thoroughly cleaned between each user by the users themselves. The kitchens, um, and I'm personally really disappointed about this because we all know that people gather in the kitchens. Um, it's where a lot of the, um, the vibrancy happens, but ultimately we're, we're effectively gonna close the kitchens, but we don't wanna cut off people's access to coffee. So Tides has purchased a, um, a bunch more coffee urns and will actually set them around, strategically around our office space so that less people are touching each urn and then our facility staff will be refilling them. The same thing with, with hot water for coffee. Um, you can see that the direction that some of this goes feels a little more concierge than um, some of us are, are used to. Um, typically we're a bit more grassroots, like if you use the last of the coffee you make more, but now it's just to reduce the amount of people touching the shared services. Um, we're also eliminating use of the um, refrigerators and microwaves. So you can think of it sort of going back to the field trip rules when we were in elementary school, you have to bring something that isn't gonna go bad and doesn't need to be reheated. Um, and then the reception area was very self-service before for mail and packages and first aid supplies. Now essentially anything that you need will need to be retrieved by our staff up there. Um, we might even set, which, and they're often running around taking care of other things around the building. So we were thinking about setting set office hours where they would, where tenants and staff would know that between the hours of say, you know, 10 and 11 and one and two, that someone will be at the desk if they need something. Go ahead and go to the next slide. I think, I know this is a lot of details. I hope this is helpful. Um, just additional um, regulation and guidance, which a lot of these have already been shared. Again, you'll get these, um, you'll get these uh, slides. So you'll be able to click through the links. Lena, go ahead and go through. Um, that's the, the how to wear a medical mask safely. Um, again, putting something like that just so uh, around the building. Um, and then uh, we have a draft mask policy um, as well. Um, these are all pulled from different sources. You can see the World Health Organization did the mask uh, diagram. And then next slide, please. Um, I know this is, is a bit dizzying. This is from um, Seaforth Law Firm. Um, a return to work process for employees that Tides is currently adapting to make its own. Um, I, I would strongly recommend that you have a plan that if someone is um, test positive or has been exposed, you know very quickly um, who, you know, who is going to manage that, um, who gets in touch with local authorities, those, those sort of things. And next slide, which I believe is the last. Um, and then also the employee screening process. We still have not reached a, a perfect, uh, perfect answer around whether um, we will, lots of our tenants are in self-contained offices. 
um, that have their own bathrooms and kitchens. And so some of this will be us passing it down to the tenants and saying, because you're managing this on your own, here are some of our recommendations. We also have tenants that share our space in a much more intimate way. They are in the bathroom with Tide's employees and sharing, um, or at some point we're sharing Tide's kitchen. Um, and so for those employees, we might loop them in, we might group them into kind of the more intense screening zone, just because to mitigate the risk to our own employees, but then make recommendations to tenants that are more self-contained. Um, I think that's it. And I know I um, talked really quickly. And yeah, thank, thanks for uh, thanks for hearing. Thanks, Lexi. I know there's just so much information to share and I know there's a lot of questions coming in. I'm gonna to jump to Tim and if we don't get to some of these questions, um, we'll definitely try to follow up as best we can. Um, so Tim, I'll hand it over to you. Hi, Lena, um, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to participate today. Um, I was asked, um, while not directly related to the reopening of nonprofit centers, I was asked to talk about my experience um, having been through um, several major events um, throughout my 34 year career in San Francisco. Um, you know, I've been here through the dot com crash of 99, 2000, 9 11, and the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Um, COVID's different. It's the first one that's a physical effect as well as an economic effect. Um, you know, in San Francisco, like most major cities throughout the country, real estate has gotten very expensive over the last five years. Um, and COVID's going to have a significant impact on that. I'll spend a few minutes talking about, you know, um, specifics as it's related to San Francisco, the last three impacts and then talk about what, you know, we're forecasting for, you know, what we think is gonna happen here with, uh, because of COVID. Um, the three graphs I'm gonna share, the first one is um, absor net absorption, class A rental rates and vacancy uh, from 1990 to the present. And I apologize for the, uh, it's a very complicated graph, but Lena will send this out and so you can look at it on your own. Um, the second graph will be um, the NASDAQ and how it, and the Dow Jones and how it relates to class A rents. And again, this is San Francisco specific. And then the third graph will be the investment sale prices in class A rents. Um, and so Lena, if we could go back one, that would be great. Um, you know, in San Francisco during the dot com crash of 1999 and 2000, we saw 6.4 million square feet of negative absorption. It took average rents down from $72 per square foot to $29 per square foot. So, you know, roughly 35% or 65%. Um, during 2008, 2009, we saw 3 million square feet of negative absorption and average rents fell from $46 to $35 um, dollars per square foot. Um, as of the fourth quarter, um, uh, 2019 in San Francisco, we had average rents over $100 a square foot. First quarter uh, results have average rents reduced to a little over $90 a square foot for 10% reduction already. Um, you know, with 20 million people unemployed um, nationally, um, you know, and in San Francisco, to, from uh, March 15th to the present, um, you know, basically shelter at home to today. We've had 32 subleases hit the market for about 750,000 square feet. Um, we haven't seen the big subleases from the major layoffs of Airbnb, Lyft, um, and a number of other tenants, but we are anticipating that. Um, you know, I think it's likely we will see um, you know, sublease vacancy of, you know, a million and a half to two and a half, three million square feet, which is going to have a significant impact on, on, on rents and investment values. Um, if you want to go to the next one, um, next slide, please. This graph just shows, you know, the effects of, uh, or how the, in San Francisco, particularly, um, how the, the market um, 
parallels the the rental market parallels NASDAQ and Dow Jones. Um, if you look at the period from um, 2000 to 2001, 2002, we saw um, basically the Dow go from 14,000 to 7,500, uh, or excuse me, um, this is more current, 2008, 2009, um, Dow go from 14,000 to 7,500, almost approximately 50% of its value. Rents went down from 46 to $35 per square foot. Um, you know, with Dow, you know, the reaching 29,000 uh, in, you know, the first first quarter of this year, uh, obviously it's, it, you know, we had a significant fall initially in, in March. It's regained much of its losses to the surprise of many. Um, but, um, you know, I think you, there, there's an interesting parallel between the Dow and NASDAQ and, and rents as it relates to San Francisco. Next graph, please. And again, a, another complicated one, but you know, if people are looking at potentially opening up nonprofit centers, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting time. Um, you know, again, rents have gotten very expensive. Um, building values, you know, have topped, you know, eleven hundred, twelve hundred dollars a square foot in San Francisco. Um, you know, we've in the, in the last three cycles, we saw prices in two thousand and two thousand and two go from four hundred dollars a square foot to two hundred dollars a square foot. During two thousand nine, two thousand and ten, from six hundred dollars a square foot to two hundred and fifty dollars a square foot. Um, you know, where are they going to go today from, you know, average sale prices of 1150 a square foot, um, you know, based on the a few transactions during the first quarter, the average is $904. Um, I think it's too early to tell and there's not enough metrics as to, you know, what's going to happen in the future, but guaranteed they're going to be lower. Um, that's it from a graph standpoint. Um, from a Long-term occupancy and physical, um, you know, real estate um, standpoint. I think you know, and this is just my opinion, um, based on what I'm hearing. Um, you know, and being an occupant of a high-rise office building in downtown San Francisco, we're struggling with reopening. On you know, as everybody's talked about, is how you're going to work in the environment. Um, I think, you know, the idea of shared um, office environments where people don't have assigned seating um, is probably going to go away. Um, I think the tabletop um, seating arrangements of many of the tenants today that have gone to the, you know, the, the amount of square footage per person from, you know, what was generally 175 to 225 uh, square feet per, per occupant in the, you know, going back, you know, many years ago to today where it's, you know, more in the 125 to 150 square feet per person. I think we're going to see, you know, workstations again, rather than tabletops. I think we're going to see tenants gravitate to, um, you know, spaces that they can physically control. Um, and, you know, I think Tides um, buildings in the Presidio are a prime example of that, where each, you know most of the tenants occupy their own premises, own building. Um, and I, you know, I, so I think we'll see that effect. I think we'll see, um, you know, again bigger workstations per employee. Um, Transportation is going to be an interesting one, just because um, you know in your major environments, like most major urban areas, people take public transportation. Um, how is that going to be dealt with? You know, um, it, that'll be an interesting thing. Um, that's really all I have. Great, thank you so much. I appreciate it, Tim, and um, I can ask all our panelists to come back on video and sound. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in and you know the trick around this is different cities or states have different um, guidelines or you know what they're considering. For Denver it's you know they're asking people to wear masks when they go out to public places but that might not be the case and how they can enforce that. 
Um, but with that said, um, Chris, I wanted to throw the question to you about um, notifying others in the building if someone's become sick, because I thought the Alliance Center did a really good job for, with this off the bat of respecting the person who was sick, um, but keeping uh, safety and health of others, um, you know, prioritizing that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks, Lena. Um, you know, we did have two instances where there was an individual that was potentially exposed um, or was exposed. They neither, to my knowledge, ever developed any symptoms. But um, immediately upon notifying, and this is what we would recommend, is immediately upon being notified is we sent messaging out to our full community. Um, these messages in the past have been exclusively email. To date, we do have a texting system that we can notify uh, others as well uh, via text, but that was the first step. Um, and then I think the remaining portion of that question was uh, how long should the building remain closed? And CDC, my, my recollection is that they, they request uh, 24 hours of a complete closure of the areas that are impacted. Um, and then after that 24 hours, then a cleaning and disinfection. And if I remember correctly, you were able to specify, okay, it was this floor, but you, you're not going to call out the, the person, <laughs> the organization. Correct. Yeah, no, we, um, we, it's very important for HIPAA requirements not to disclose the organization or obviously the individual's name. So um, we had a, uh, a number of individuals that asked for more information that we were um, apologetic and certainly understanding that they desired more information due to various personal nature uh, needs, but um, needed to maintain that privacy. Yeah. Um, and just a heads up, we're going to go just a few minutes over to try to tackle a few more of these questions. Um, uh, regarding the HIPAA issues, when it comes to taking people's temperatures, how do you effectively do that contact tracing, given the ADA does not allow for you to share who, who was sick? Um, as anyone have any suggestions on how you're handling that? Now, I'm curious what everybody else's answer is on that, because I, I, too, was thinking that. Yeah, feel free to type into the chat. And I'm, I know I've been thinking about, well, who's responsible for taking the temperatures and, and protecting those folks? Or for me, I'm one individual of our organization in the building. So who's going to verify my temperate, my own temperature checks if it's not the building doing it, if it's your own, um, just the people within your organization? One of our tenants suggested taking turns on that. Like, well, everybody, <laughs> I don't see that working, quite honestly. Um, and then who pays for the PPE required for, for that? You know, that was mm -hmm. our, other, our other issue. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've gone, we've identified a few individuals on our team that could take the temperature. Um, it's uh, looking at the HIPAA requirements. I'm not 100% certain that um, we've reviewed all of those needs or all of those requirements, but we've identified a few people on our team who would be doing those testings immediately upon someone on our staff arriving to work. Um, what about training videos? Are any of you preparing for those um, in addition to just communicating information on websites and emails about how people should re-enter the building and the protocols for being in the space? We haven't put any videos together, but I was just sharing on the Q&A that a lot of the tenants have told me that they've purchased their own Clorox wipes or spray in addition to the regular cleaning that we have. Um, and they're and they're using those. I mean, not you know that's not a hundred percent, and I don't know the frequency and intensity, but I do. I have seen some of them wiping down their handles, um, their workspaces, um, those types of things. Everybody's been mentioning the kitchen. I forgot to say this. I just mentioned our conference rooms, but we have not. We have had no use in our kitchen as well. We are also looking at creating a, a tenant survey um, because we have so many tenants to really understand what they're thinking um, around returning. I mean, some, some folks may, um, may stick with a work from home, whether you know, we have lots of uh, small shops on campus, one or two person organizations. And if they're, you know, if they have, um, you know, childcare or they're using public transit, it's possible that they're not planning on returning, um, you know, in the near future. And then that can help gauge our response and even our janitorial service. If we know that one building will only be 30% full through the summer, 
then that can help us gauge um, sort of our response to that building, um, our, you know, our safety concerns around, around that. Um, and so we're, we're planning on getting information from tenants themselves and asking, um, asking about that as well. Great, thanks. Um, we have a question about, and this, I know this is probably challenging, has anyone analyzed the incremental cost increase, the percentage increase in operating costs due to additional staffing, shifts and supplies? Are you absorbing these or assessing passing a proportion onto your tenants? Yeah, we've actually seen a decrease in operational costs lately just because of less people being on the campus. So like the F, our, our power bill is about a couple thousand less than it usually is. Um, uh, water bill as well. So right now it's less. Now we have not had the big conversation about purchasing additional cleaning or PPE. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would echo that sentiment in terms of the utility side of things. Our, uh, the cleaning side of the equation, we've definitely seen a, an uptick just given the uh, disinfections that we've done in our building and the, in, the inclusion of a day porter once we do re, uh, reoccupy the building. So there will be some additional things there. The topic of uh, staggered work schedules or uh, additional operational costs there, uh, haven't looked at that in, in any depth. Yeah, we were actually talking about switching our janitorial team. Currently we have one quarter and then a nighttime team that comes in and, and does everything while, while folks aren't there. So actually transitioning more people to the daytime shift um, so that our costs are the same, but the, cover the coverage is different um, and you know, a better fit for this current moment where it's really the high touch services that need to be um, wiped down constantly. Um, let's see, am I missing, let's see any major questions? Yeah, I, I think just for some of you have been answering them online through typing. <laughs> yeah, and I want to highlight that uh, David, my colleague from Tides, um, he said, we're still struggling with the risks around ADA issues and temp temperature taking. Um, and we're expecting some government guidance around this. So I think that we should all just stay tuned about what, um, right, what, what this means, how to protect people's privacy, who should be, who should be doing this. Um, for the most part, we are going to try to do um, all of this with our existing team, both our Tides team, our property management team, um, but I know we're, we're also lucky to have, have a large infrastructure staff. Um, it just means that other pieces of their job won't, won't be getting done. But I was just talking to our facilities coordinator. Usually she spends a lot of time moving people around, building desks, ordering supplies. Be her job will be um, cut by sort of an order of magnitude, her responsibilities. And so we'll be able to reposition her to do some of this ordering and stocking of, um, of masks and things like that. So we're hoping that with our current team, um, everyone's job might be a little weird for the next six months, but um, we think that we'll be able to do it with the existing staff. Awesome, thank you. And we will save the chat. So some of these tips that are coming in here, we can make sure we distribute that to you all after the webinar. Um, Thank you all so much for participating. I know this is just ever evolving and that we will continue to come up with more solutions or maybe change what we've just said, um, but we'll try to get the information out to you as, as quick as possible um, to members in the greater community. Um, keep in mind, we always have off, are offered consulting services. And at this time, just given all the concerns around COVID, uh, we want to offer reduced um, pricing for hourly coaching. Um, as it relates to, to managing the issues around COVID. Um, keep in mind, NCN membership comes with one free hour of a coaching call, so try to utilize that. If you can, we are here for you. Um, we have many reports and resources, not all of them that are, are listed here, but check out our website um, to, to view those and use that time to <laughs> brush up on some of this stuff. But please, like I said in the beginning, Reach out to any of us if you have suggestions for topics moving forward. We, like I said, we have a very active community and um, getting to talk with people who are doing this kind of work across the country and, and, and Canada and navigating this um, pandemic together. Um, it's just a reminder of why, why we exist and why we come together. So thank you again, Chris, Cameron, and Tim, and Lexi, of course. Um, be well, stay safe, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you, everyone.